I awake to a rainbow of iridescent feathers clouding my vision. I pull my head out from under Quark's wing and hop down from our perch. Computer, repeat, I ask blearily. The computer answers in an uncharacteristically urgent tone. I say again, 37 separate messages detailing various disparate descriptions of a hitherto undetermined emergency have been logged within the last 66 minutes. All attempts to identify the source and nature of the emergency and resolve it without crew intervention have failed. More appropriate cause of action determined to be raise the captain and advise her to gather security officers and the engineering lead to seek out the source and nature of the emergency and attempt to resolve it. My stomach drops. I turn to Quark, his face a mask of dread, and his beautiful plumish wilting too, momentarily seeming almost as drab as my coat of matte grey, white and black. I run to him, and throw my wings around him, and in as soothing a voice as I can manage, while I convey the urgency, I say, Seal the door when I'm gone. Do not open it under any circumstances for anyone but me. Even if I'm taken hostage and they threaten to kill me, that door stays shut. Do you understand me? Stammering, he says, But, but I, you, but, it, it, they, they, I snap. Do you understand me? He slumps. Yes, my Okla. I tenderly tap the side of my beak against his, and looking down into his eyes, I say, Thank you, sweet fruit. As I leave, he calls out, desperately, Come back to me, to Qual. Don't allow our daughter to grow up, never having met her mother. Without turning, I answer, I don't intend to. Some minutes later, Plop, 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 plop. Plop, 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 plop. So, what did the report say? Asks engineering lead Quidge, against the steady pitter patter of her twelve gel coated, manipular, perambulatory tentacles on the bridge deck corridor. Jogging beside her, I answer. The common theme is that they describe being woken by a terrifying noise. Could you slow down? Her single eye wheels down to mine without her forward momentum breaking. I'm sorry, Captain. It really sounds like we don't have time. None of the Triple M's responded to compings. Yes, I couldn't get my SS, SO, or ASO to respond. Nor anyone else in Triple M. No one on decks? 406 was brave enough to venture out to make contact. It's possible. Whatever this threat is, there are already casualties. Quidditch's skin flashes through Pruse, Magneta, and Orange, which her translator renders as a pathetic squeal. Seeming to steal herself, she asks, Nature? Some reports speculate pirates. Some hyperdrive malfunction. One, vengeful warrior ghosts. Obviously, you're here, in case it's an engineering problem. I don't expect you to fight pirates or exercise spirits. Being 1.3 meters and 2.5 kilograms of mostly bone and feather really has its disadvantages. Keep in stride with 3.8 decorated pods being one. Reaching the door of the starboard stairwell, I burst through, not waiting for it to fully slide open. I can hear a distant but intense noise in the distance down below me, but I'm not able to see over the safety rail. Irritated, I hop it and perch, looking down. That terrible caterwauling is coming from down there somewhere. Looking over the railing, through her Google Aquarespirator, Quidditch asks, Any ideas? Can you identify it? No, it's... I... I freeze. That's... no. They wouldn't. Motherfucking Dragon Force! I shriek, in a mangled approximation of the English loanwords. What? Quidge asks, clearly alarmed. I gratefully con Quark. Quark, my love, it was a false alarm. Don't worry, I'll be back a little later after I've sorted it out. Clearly relieved, he says. By Akaros, that eases my mind. So I can open the... No, you cannot open the door. I told you not to open the door for anyone but me, didn't I? What if I were being held at gunpoint right now? I snap. But if... But nothing. Open the door only when you can see it's me and I'm alone. Okay, I'll see you later. Assuming you're not at gunpoint right now. My chitter of that. Try to get back to sleep for the time being, sweet fruit. Shutting off my holopad, I address Quitch. Stand down, Quitch. Your expertise is not required in this matter. Quitch looks more lost than ever. Captain, what is it? Did you say parental copulating leviathan power. What's the leviathan powering? And why does that require it to copulate a parent? Not answering, I say. Return to your hab tank, Quitch, and try to get some rest. You'll only slow me down from here. Hesitantly, she asks, what are you going to do? 
Cocksure, I say. Me? Why, I'm going to crush a deaf world to party. Quidge's whole body pales. You're a braver woman than I, Captain. Wordlessly, I tumble backwards over the railing and perform a tight roll in air to right myself. I dive down 50 metres and out 20 from my star point, spreading out my wings to the last possible moment to arrest my momentum, alighting on the balcony of what was formerly known as Starboard Dorm, Deck 5. As I stride beneath it, I glance up at a hand-painted sign that reads, Mundus Minimus Mortis, painted in red, one metre tall letters, of a long dead Terran language which now serves as a linguistic astratum for most of the Terran cultures. McLeod's edition, Telescus Mortis, is written in five centimetres black lettering in the corner. That sign was an addition of the first seven diurnals, or week, after the Terran hiring. This deck is now known as Triple M, and its inhabitants the Triple M's. There goes my orderly numbering system. Three, four, MMM, six, I enter the dorm hall and the sound is deafening. It's so loud I can't really discern a direction, but from intuition, I head to the common room. The tempo is so high and the instrument so coordinated that if Terence did not exist, I would say it could only have been constructed on a computer, never played naturally. This is music so intense that if Terence did not exist, I would say no being could have survived feeling the emotions necessary to write it. This is music so ferocious that if Terence did not exist, it could only be the defiant knell of warriors who knew they were moments from martyrdom in a blaze of glory. But for Terrans, it's just Tuesday. As the common room door slides open, I am hit with a wall of sound, seemingly nearly strong enough to knock me over. So far away we wait for the day, for the light source so wasted and gone. We feel the pain of a lifetime lost in a thousand days. Through the fire and the flames we carry on. CSS Victor Cardles Taylor is standing flanked by SO Brunhilde Samoseran and ASO Toon Elf, screaming into microphones, gesticulating wildly with their five spare hands, faces screwed. Backed by the distinctly unmusical yowling of Fluffy, in addition to a pair of speakers, taller than I am, combining their amplified voices with a furious backing track. Commissary Krish Cookie Dwahan. Engineer Jenny Mouse McLeod, researcher Misa Mage Zumberi, and Brunhilde's Samoid Husky Mitz Canine Sam are sat speculating on a giant couch. They're so enraptured that Zumberi is the only one to notice me standing there, glaring at the scene. Trepidatiously, he fumbles for the control panel and shuts off the cacophony. The other Triple M's are each perplexed for 1.5 seconds before they notice me standing, scowling. I fold my wings behind my back, a distinctly unnatural posture for me, and began pacing while keeping my gaze fixed on the crowd of them. After a full 15 seconds of silence, Taylor starts, Cap, I... But my wing shoots up with a single claw extended, indicating that the silence is to continue. A few more seconds pass before I deem them all sufficiently cowed. I stroll over to the panel by the door. On it, there is a grey switch beside a white dial. Experimentally, I flick the switch from the off position to the on position, and all ambient noise from beyond the room ceases. Back to the off and the low ambient from of a ship in warp is back. One more flick and it's gone. I turn to them and say, your privacy field appears to be functional, just not enabled. Yet I can see from the compromise of brightness and dimness to suit both bright worlders and murk worlders that someone here knows this panel exists. More pacing, more silence. I flick my crown plume and affect a Terran sigh. Massaging my temples with my wing claws, I ask, While I am extremely glad you're all alive and not slaughtered by pirates, ripped into atoms by warp malfunction, or possessed by the spirits of ventral warriors, as the reports I was receiving would have had me believe, while my heart sing that I get to go back to my mate, alive, and show him it was a false alarm, I can't help but feel a little fucking livid that this whole mass panic could have been avoided with a flick of a switch. And why by the Titan, by the Pygmy, by the Watcher, and by the Orchidist, did none of you answer your damn comms? At this, Sam bounds forward, but thankfully is well trained enough to know that I will die if he runs into me at that speed, so stops short and starts frankly sniffing my front with an apologetic demeanour. Captain Bird Mummy, not angry being. Please, 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 we is happy time being. Sorry, 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 not mean to upset you, you being. Not be angry, not be cross, Sam yaps. Translators really don't work well on near sapience. 
Despite my not being a Terran, this cuteness offensive is working. I bend down to look Sam in the eye. Captain Bird Mummy isn't angry with you, Sam. You and Fluffy have done nothing wrong. I glance at Fluffy. This time. Why don't you and Fluffy go to bed? I'm sure you're tired. Sam hangs his head dejectedly and leaves the room, shortly followed by Fluffy. I'm very grateful Taylor is resistant to the idea of getting her a translator. I shudder to think what she'd say. I point to the three standing death orders and snap my beak. Sit down, gesturing to the couch. They swiftly comply. Pacing again, I ask, So, no communicators. You what, left your hollows in your rooms? Uh, no phones party? What if there had been a real emergency? If we'd been boarded? If we had needed our brave knights in shining armor to come and slay some Terran dragons? And they were too busy karaokeing to notice. This is the fourth incident of its kind in the two subcycles since I hired you. Requisitions Officer Hamitonio still hasn't mentally recovered from his detainment and copious licking after the fluffy containment breach of Durinal 15. What were you thinking? I'm not your mother. I don't want to have to police when you go to bed, but Akaros knows I'm not going to let you keep the whole ship up with you. I don't want to have to install a surveillance camera in this room. I don't want to check that every emergency isn't just Terrans being Terrans. And another thing! Much later. Now I'm through with you! You may go! I roar. The doleful Terrans fall from the room. Except you, Mr. Taylor. You stay. He looks surprised. Everyone else also looks curious, but still file out. Once the room is clear, I climb up and nestle into the love seat and gesture across the coffee table for him to sit back down on the sofa. He hesitates before asking, Can I offer you a nightcap cap? It takes a moment before my translator can make nightcap sensical to me, and when it does, I'm about to refuse out of reflex. Then I reconsider. Sure, I'm off duty tomorrow, I guess I can relax a bit. I trust you know how to mix a drink that won't kill me? He smiles. One moment, Cap. He comes back with a rather expensive looking bottle of whiskey. Two glasses, one filled with ice water, one holding a frosty stone, a stir bar and a pipette. Interested, I watch intently to see what his process is. He takes the pipette and dips it into the bottle, before repeating once, dispensing six milliliters of whiskey into the ice water and stirring it in. He places that glass in front of me. He then proceeds to pour a, frankly, ludicrous quantity of undiluted whiskey into the other glass. He raises it, and it takes me a moment before I figure out what's expected. I pick up my glass with my talons, and gently clink it against his. To your health, he toasts. To yours, I answer. I dip my beak into the mixture and tilt my head up to tip it down my throat. Even diluted, it tastes very strong to me. Drink now in foot, we sit in silence for a long while. Eventually, I start. Taylor, listen. I'm glad you're doing so much better. Anyone can see you're much happier now than you were before the Terran contingent arrived. It's just, these sort of antics are getting to be something of a drain. Emotionally and financially. Taken aback, he asks. Financially? I chitter. Default research is extremely lucrative, Taylor. That's how I can afford to pay everyone so handsomely. You, 1.7 times standard. Miss Aran, 1.2 times standard. Miss Toon, 1.8 her asking price, haggled down from 1.9. Even so, the money is not infinite. And every time something like this happens, I have to pay half the crew emotional damages. I pause here and then continue. If you start putting this ship in the red, you're going to make me choose between booting you and Fluffy off for the next port or letting you drag the ship down with you. I stare into his eyes imploringly. Taylor, you are a dear friend and I owe you my life more times than I can count, but don't make me choose between my loyalty to you and my ability to provide the livelihoods of 276 other crew members, okay? Looking more sober now than when his glasses fall, he nods. Yeah, Cap, we understand each other. I'll rein it in, no more incidents, I'm sorry. I nod. Good. I think and then add, one more thing, Taylor. Yes, Cap? The next time you throw one of these little death world of soirees of yours, invite me. His eyebrows rise at that. You're serious? I nod. Oh, yes. After all, I have the spirit of a death world, and I'd be lying if I said it didn't look like fun. Maybe with a little moderation of volume. He snickers at that. And, of course, someone has to make sure that you activate the privacy field. I smirk. He winces. Sorry again. I wave. Wind under the wing, dear boy. No water under the bridge, right? He nods. 
I finish my whiskey, and I'm about to bid him good night when he says, Cap, will I see something unforgettable before you go? I think, then nod. You have to be quiet, though. I raise a brow tuft, the alcohol haze settling in. Less of a problem for me than you, I'm sure, you great gullumping death welder. I was wrong. I thought I was quiet, but in the deathly still of Triple M Hall, I can still hear the light pit, pit, pit on my feet on the deck. Whereas he passes so silently that it's as if he isn't there. I would have thought this stuff impossible for a being more than 40 times my mass, but to Terence, the impossible is barely an inconvenience. He draws up to his and Fluffy's room and the door slides open. I gasp. Sound asleep, there are four humans, a canine and a don, all snuggling around a merc beast, also sound asleep. How? I whisper. I thought humans prefer to sleep solitarily or with a mate. Taylor bends down and whispers in a voice so quiet that it's almost impossible to consider that barely an hour ago, he sung so loud he woke and terrified half the ship. Private bedrooms are a social construct originally intended to demonstrate wealth. It then spread mimetically, so now we've forgotten that it was ever any other way. Don't get me wrong, privacy is nice sometimes, but this... He gestures at the pile. This is how humans are meant to sleep. He then turns to me and whispers in the most serious voice I've ever heard him use. The cuddle puddle is justice.